and explorers of the unknown, and welcome to Ask an Astrobiologist, the show that celebrates the science and the scientists involved in our quest to understand the nature of life. As usual, I'm your host, Dr. Graham, the Cosmobiologist Lau, and we're brought to you by the NASA Astrobiology Program and SeganNet.org. As always, we want to give a huge shout out to all of you out there sharing about our show, engaging with me, engaging with our guests, engaging with the NASA Astrobiology Program and SeganNet, um, and talking about this wonderful thing of looking for life beyond Earth and understanding life here on Earth. Uh, as, as usual, we love giving a big shout out to one person in particular who shares about the show each month as our ambassador of the month. This month, we'd like to highlight Dr. Jim Pass. Many of you have heard his questions before for our guests in the show. Dr. Pass loves to tune in and talk about astrosociology, uh, bringing the science and the understanding of human interactions to space. So thank you very much, Jim, for sharing about Ask an Astrobiologist. Now, today's episode is hopefully going to inflame your sense of adventure and interest in Mars as much as I know it will mine. Today, we have joining us Dr. Michael Meyer. He's the former lead scientist for NASA's Mars Exploration and Mars Sample Return Programs. Dr. Meyer was the program scientist for the rover Curiosity, uh, the 2001 Mars Odyssey mission. He was on the Mars Microprobe mission and for two space shuttle and Mir space station experiments. He was also the senior scientist for astrobiology from 2001 to 2006, managed NASA's exobiology program from 1994 to 1997, and was also the planetary protection officer for NASA. I mean, such incredible things. Uh, Dr. Meyer recently retired from NASA, but has returned here now to share his knowledge and his wisdom from decades of service to the science, to the space exploration, to astrobiology, to Mars, for all of us now. So, uh, Dr. Meyer, welcome and thank you for joining us for Ask an Astrobiologist. Well, I want to thank you for inviting me. Uh, as you might imagine, I'm always willing to talk about astrobiology. So thanks. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's a fun topic to talk about and one that you spent many years of your life and your career exploring. Um, as usual, we love for our guests when they first come on our show to give us a bit of their origin story, what got them into the careers they chose to pursue in their lives. We have a lot of people watching the show who maybe are young scientists or early career researchers who want to know, how can I get from where I am to where you've been in your life? So would you mind sharing a bit about your personal journey with us? Yeah, I mean, this is kind of interesting in that um, I had no intention whatsoever early on of ending up doing what I'm well, was doing for NASA, uh, it is a, pretty much a random walk. Uh, essentially, a couple of things came together. One was, you know, I, I did well enough in high school, just kind of well enough that uh, my guidance counselor said, well, you should be an engineer. You're pretty good at math. So I, I just, you know, I applied to schools and I decided I'd be an engineer. But before I actually went to college, I got hired as a deckhand for the summer uh, for treasure salvaging off of the co coast of Florida. And, you know, at the time, it was one of the things I'd been around boats as a, as a kid and I knew how to do stuff. So it was a reasonable job. Um, and I'd always been interested in the ocean, read a lot of uh, books, and uh, I love Jacques Cousteau. You know, this is, I figured that would be such a great thing to, to have adventures at sea and, you know, go scuba diving and see all these great things. So when I was on at working as a deckhand, uh, the person who was running the operation fired all the other divers because basically they were, uh, they were smoking while they were working. <laughs> and uh, so it wasn't really the best of conditions. And uh, that he asked me if I wanted to learn how to dive. So I started diving. And, so, and the first time I went in the water, it was kind of like, whoa, everything I thought I knew now, although I recognize things, 
Now it made more sense. Now it was an environment, not just pretty pictures or pretty fish or pretty, you know, that kind of thing. It was an environment in which I was in and immersed in it. And that was, uh, that was a powerful experience and kind of convincing me that we know so little about things that we think we know something about. So that was one of the things that uh, really got me interested. And then um, I went to college as, a, you know, started as an engineer. And I must admit, I didn't find engineering. I found ent- engineering kind of interesting, but I found biology much more interesting. So I went into biology, in particular cell biology, because at that time, we were just learning about cells, you know, what the structures were, what does the endoplasmic reticulum do, that kind of thing. And I thought, you know, th- there's, a lot of, there's a lot of exploration here. There's a lot of room for new knowledge because nobody knows what's going on. They're just bringing new tools on that give them a better look about what's going on within the cell. And I found that pretty exciting. So, um, pursued that course. I must, you know, and it's one of those things where then I went on to graduate school in oceanography, got a doctorate in oceanography and biological oceanography, looking at single cell plants in the ocean. I ended up doing a lot of work in polar areas, actually around Antarctica. And that put me on the path to studying life in extreme environments. The first real job I got um, as a postdoc was actually working with someone, Emory Friedman in Florida, who was studying single cell plants in deserts around the world. And it's kind of like, I remember the phone interview, you know, he's, we're talking and after about 10 minutes, I go, you know, Emory, I am getting a, my degree in oceanography, right? <laughs> and he goes, what's your problem? My degree is in marine biology. So it was kind of like, that was our, our, our bond. And uh, after that, you know, I did a lot of research, uh, deserts around the world. And that got me into the whole NASA thing of using life in extreme environments as a model to what we should be looking for elsewhere and what should the approach be. And, uh, and that was great. Very interesting. I had lots. I loved field work. And then uh, as a you know, assistant professor kind of thing, I decided, you know, I should probably go and check that bureaucratic box, go to headquarters, run a program for two years, get something on the books that will be a benefit to scientists in areas I like, I mean, like looking for life elsewhere. And then I'll go back to my research and I'll be in a better position to, you know, get the next step up and that kind of thing. Well, I got there And I found, A, you could get a lot done if you have a purpose. And um, it was, I decided after a couple of years, and they wanted me to stay, that I was probably the most glib microbiologist I knew. And that I could actually get more science done where I was at headquarters than I would as a researcher. And so that's kind of started me on the path of, I was started to run the exobiology program. And, uh, and I, my purpose was NASA needs to recognize that they have the tool to look for life elsewhere. This is the new thing, the new technology that we can now answer questions about things that we've been asking for millennia. And now we can actually get some data. So... That, yeah. And then the rest has been a, a fun ride. That's incredible. And such a cool way to kind of bring together these interests you started off with as a young person and kind of bringing those into this realm. It's kind of interesting you had this experience kind of like, you know, salvaging and treasure hunting and then connecting that to a different kind of treasure hunting and looking at life in deserts and polar environments and then looking for life out there, which is very much a form of treasure hunting as well for many of us in the astrobiology realm. Um, now, of course, a lot of your a lot of your background through NASA and your, t- your time with NASA was focused on Mars missions, their development, and their history. And so, you know, you really are a great person to ask this question of. You know, through all of your roles at NASA, how have you seen the arc of Mars exploration and Mars missions, um, including planetary science and astrobiology? How have you seen that grow and evolve to where we are now? 
So, oh, that's a that's an interesting question. The well, number one, what Viking was a little over fifty years ago. You know, our first real kind of first, uh, you know, astrobiology kind of mission. So we had a lot to go through. Um, and I think one of the things that, that I think is really critical to understand is in that time period, Viking was disappointed for most of the scientific work. And it was a fantastic mission, very successful, did some great things, but the expecting to find little aliens running around and not find anything, everybody just kind of went, oh, never mind. That was a, a wrong direction to go in. But at the same time, we've discovered life in hydrothermal beds in the bottom of the ocean. This was a big surprise at that time. And Brock was finding life in extremely hot environments elsewhere. And so there is this disconnect between oh, Mars is too harsh, there's no life there, and oh, we're finding life in places on Earth that we never expected because we thought it was too extreme for them to live there. Mm-hmm. That, that, it was a great setup, right? Um, and so one of the really nice things that happened is we were able to move exobiology from, at the time, was the OSSA, Office of Space and Office of Space Sciences, uh, Sciences and Application. Um, and they had the life sciences portion of it, you know, uh, what experiments to do on space station, that sort of thing. Uh, but the, the real, let's say, where exobiology, astrobiology really pay off is getting missions elsewhere and looking at life on other planetary bodies or looking for Sides of life around extrasolar planets. So we were able to move it into this, the science directorate that was doing the physical and physical sciences, right? And I think that ended up being very useful in that now the questions being asked were related to what missions were possible and what missions can ask, you know, able to ask the right questions. So one of the things extremely fortuitous is early on we did this strategy well if we're going to look for life elsewhere how should we do it and you know by using the lessons from viking and also what in our own planet we realized we don't really know that much we have a lot to learn about biology and we only have one example on earth so the exobiology strategy for mars exploration laid out a path of Go to the planet and orbit it and do things on a global scale. If it still looks good, now you need to focus on regions with better instruments. If that still looks good, send things to the surface so you can see whether or not what you thought you knew, you really knew, and whatever else you can find out. If it still looks good, then get those samples or bring them home. So that's been sort of a a guidepost for the whole program. And... As we, as an example for Mars, as we've looked harder, it's still been promising and telling us that there's still a potential. So the whole art was kind of like that. I would say one of the things fortuitous, this is back to what I was thinking about, is when we're getting astrobiology going, trying to promote the idea, we had two major scientific events. ALH 84001, the Mars meteorite, that had wonderfully interesting things to offer in terms of uh, telling us about Mars, including the possibility of life, and then also finding extrasolar planets, first confirmed extrasolar planet. Both, both of those happened within about a year of each other. And one of the, and that catapulted exobiology, astrobiology into a recognition, not only is this a great question, but also legitimate science. Because at the time, exobiology had the highest number of National Academy members, you know, proportion-wise, than any other program in at NASA. And so when they looked into it, they said, oh, this is actually 
legitimate science and asking and their big questions. And obviously these big questions, there could be some pretty big answers. And so that helped catapult yeah. things forward. And, um, and that started a real program where astrobiology got part of missions going to other planets, part of the astronomy program. And I think now it's, now we're getting data back. Now we're trying to sort through things that we're, we, we're really learning. Yeah, no kidding. And I love that you connect the arc of Mars exploration to the arc of astrobiology at NASA as well. Like they're, they are very highly connected. And I think a lot of younger students maybe who are coming up now and exploring astrobiology as a career or as, you know, or just a research interest perhaps, um, they have the astrobiology primer that early career researchers have written. They can see the old astrobiology roadmaps, the astrobiology strategy. You know, we have all of these connections to the Mars program and the things that have happened previously. Um, and, you know, the, the NASA astrobiology program itself um, is a world leader in considering life in a cosmic context. And so, you know, the program has developed, you've seen it grow now, along with the, the, the Mars program as astrobiology has, has grown and blossomed out. Is there a vision you have for where maybe the, the future researchers who are watching right now, uh, where their work in astrobiology and Mars exploration might take us? I'll say two things. One is uh, one of the challenges of the early program was convincing people who were doing other things than quotes biology that they might be astrobiologists. And so part of the strategy is laying out the things that we need to know are not just how organisms work. We, didn't, we need to know the physical and chemical environment. We need to know whether or not water was on Mars three billion years ago, that sort of thing. So part of it is recognizing that your role in all of astrobiology is whatever discipline you're really good at, making sure you're aware of how that connects to the possibility of life. And so as we go forward and start exploring more things, there are some real areas of research that are be, going to be coming up if you look to what future missions are going to be, or even ones that are going to happen. Like, you, you know, the uh, Europa Clipper is going to bring back data in, I forget, some five, six year, I forget quite the time frame, but this launching this, this fall. And there will be a lot of, what does this data mean? And you can be prepared with the type of experiments that might actually help supplement the data that's coming back and, and, and helps inform everybody else, what is the meaning of this? And examples for, in the past of Mars exploration is the whole thing with perchlorate, something that we didn't expect. And so now there's a fair amount of research being done on that. The other is, what is deliquescence? And is that an issue? Does that provide a temporary environment that life can flourish and you know and it depends on it's actually one of those things where it's a it's a kinetics thing as opposed to a state so mm -hmm. i guess that's one thing the other is keep your eyes open because you don't know what's gonna you know i got into this whole thing because i was just doing what i thought was interesting and by doing something that was interesting and not necessarily what everybody else told you was interesting i actually had a a, a nice background that other people didn't when mm. it came time to putting things together. Yeah, that's crucial. Yeah, ha having a, a diversity and of interests and skills is, is super important. And you, you mentioned already some of these key milestones of astrobiology, even finding hydrothermal vents and finding exoplanets, and you know this this work with the Allen Hills meteorite and and some of these other major milestones with Viking and some uh, other research that we've had. That you know we really didn't know some of these things were going to be so important in our understanding of life in a universal context. Um, you mentioned you also mentioned earlier in the the arc of Mars exploration programs this idea of eventually getting to the point of bringing samples back. Um, of course, you know, Mars sample return has been a big question. Um, which samples can we bring back? How can we interrogate them? Um, a lot of people also are worried potentially about issues. You, you've done work in the Planetary Protection Office. As a Planetary Protection Officer, um, I wonder, like, how realistic is the Andromeda strain, for instance, as a scenario for Mars samples? Um, how can we frame the value of returning those samples um, along with addressing some potential threats uh, or that might worry some people? Well, that's a very good question. And it's one of those things where it, it's a real challenge. 
because uh, despite all our efforts, we don't have a tricorder yet. We don't have a measurement that tells us whether or not something is live. I mean, there's things that you could do where if it walks in front of you, then you know it's alive kind of thing. But we, on the molecular level, on the cellular level, we don't have we don't have a good handle on it. We have a reasonable handle on life on Earth because we know enough about it. We know the the experiment to do. You know, we know what food to feed it to see if it eats it kind of thing. So, for planetary protection, this is a, a a real issue. I mean, the Mars samples are tremendously important. Uh, and I'll, I'll give some sort of comparisons. Right now, the closest we will look at anything on the surface of Mars is a couple of orders of magnitude less than we could look at pieces of Mars we brought them back to Earth. So we're way outside the scale of a micro. So we just haven't even looked at things at the scale that is, let's say, critically important for understanding the potential of life on Mars. The other is, when we've analyzed things on Mars, it's been fantastic, and we found it so interesting, but it's been bulk. We've been taking a sample, taking the whole sample, and vaporizing it, or looking at it with a spectrometer. We get some spatial resolution on a pretty crude scale with remote sensing, of, you know, close up, like Raman spectroscopy and that sort of thing. But we don't actually know how the minerals are interacting with each other. You bring the samples back, each grain that you get has a story. It has a geologic history that's preserved in what it is. And you can look at it, it'll tell you. And so if you get a bunch of different grains, you can, t you can look at them and say, oh, these all came from one event or they came from a huge number of different events, that kind of thing. Uh, also being the grains together, they're gonna interact and it tells you what was going on between when they're deposited to when you got it. So the taphonomy, so what happened in between. They go through periods of wet and all that kind of thing. We have some good theories, but you need to look at the rocks themselves. So the amount that we can learn from bringing samples back is going to, oh, that's what's going on. It'll, it'll be, you know, comes to light, right? Now, looking for life. Uh, that's a real challenge because you have very small samples. You can't just throw them in a Petri dish and hope something shows up because it could be completely wrong. We can't even take soil out of our backyard, throw it in a Petri dish, and grow everything that's there. In fact, you only grow like 1% of what's there. So it's 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 complicated, right? Mm -hmm. um, and And we're just now working through, and this is where research is very helpful. And what things do we think are characteristic of life? And so what should we look for? And we have sort of this ongoing thing in astrobiology of agnostic biosignatures. And the idea is you don't look for a specific compound, you look for a complex compound. And then you decide whether or not it could be made from you know, chemistry or is it made from biology? And you have to look at it from a different direction it works with that. So these are kind of the research that's very helpful. And we're working through what, you know, when we get the samples back, we're working through right now, what is the protocol to say, okay, we did not find anything in this sample. It's okay to send to the outside world. We'll send some sterilized samples to start with just so that we get other information while we're waiting. And then you can declare this to be sent out to the outside world. how to make that process efficient and convincing is a real challenge. I think we can do a really good job. So addressing sort of the last question of, you know, the risk versus benefit, that kind of thing. Um, I, I just want to point out that the more bizarre life is, is was on Mars, Perhaps the more difficult it is for us to find it, find what it's doing. But also the more, let's say, unusual or super bug life, you know, pur purported Martian life is, um, the more 
unbelievable it would be that all the Mars meteorites we're getting on Earth today haven't already started a Martian colony. So, so, the, so the point is, we don't have to expect something amazingly unusual in terms of capabilities because we've been getting Mars rocks since day one on the surface of Earth, and we don't have anything that has shown up as, you know, what's this alien thing doing? It hasn't happened. So, so you, you should be cautious. You should do, you know, you should do what you need to do to convince yourself that, okay, that this is not an issue. Or you go, wow, we, we did the uh, looking for complex organics and we just found a whole chain of them. Okay, now, we, you know, we're in the money. We now have something to really look at. And, and, and that's great news Either way, it's great news because we're going to learn something about early Mars and whether or not life really got started and died out, whether or not it just didn't quite get there because of X or Y. But either way, we're going to get a data point that tells us how common is life in the universe. Mm, that's fantastic. Yeah, and you know, Mars really could be the first other place we could find life or not find life, yeah. which is super important. Um, I do want to go to a poll that we had for our audience now on YouTube. Uh, you've been involved involved with the Mars Odyssey uh, spacecraft, the mission, and those first actual detections of water. We knew, we knew since Viking and early images there were signs of the activity of water, but really finding like detections of hydrous minerals and understanding that there had been water in the past on Mars's surface is a huge finding. And so we thought based on that, and you've even mentioned like organics on Mars and then like um, Mars meteorites. We wanted to ask our audience what they thought were like that was like the key milestone of Mars exploration, especially for astrobiology. Uh, we gave the option of detection of water on Mars, exploring Martian meteorites, uh, detection of organic compounds on Mars, or exploring the methane on Mars mystery. Okay. Um, and most of most of the, those who responded, fifty four percent percent of those who responded, uh, said that detection of organic compounds on the surface of Mars has been the most important milestone. I wonder if you can speak to that. Uh, how important has it been, you know, using our rovers to detect organic compounds on the surface of Mars, and knowing that there is organic chemistry now for us to explore? So, in some ways, you kind of captured it, right? We we know that there's organic compounds landing on Mars because of the infall from meteorites. Meteorites have organic, well, not all, but have organic compounds. So there's a certain baseline that you expect to find. But, you know, one of the things that we picked up from Vikings is the surface of Mars is highly oxidizing. And we also knew for quite some time that it's also highly irradiated. So complex compounds would get zotted and uh, through time, basically oxidize and turn to carbon dioxide or, or some kind of highly refractory material. So you got it. The fact that we find complex organic compounds on Mars means that something, there was something there for us to find. It also points to one of the huge challenges of sending spacecraft to Mars and trying to do our experiments versus bring the samples back. We learn that there are complex organic compounds. It's a real struggle to figure out what the parent compound was that before you vaporized it and measure the components of it. And that's critical. That's the part that tells you, is this a, a molecule that we can't make in, in our physical chemical world? It has to be done biology. Or is it something, oh yeah, this is, this is just a, a, a product of the fischer trough reaction. So it makes a huge difference on how how that complex compound, what it is, because that tells you, that gives you a hint, I should put it that way, gives you a hint of how it might have been. So the fact that we can measure it with the crude instruments we're studying on spacecraft, it crude is, is over is an exaggeration, they're highly sophisticated, but they're not something you can do in the lab. Tells us that there's enough there for us to have a lot of fun measuring the things that are in the samples at a, a along the lines of organic. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, I will say, so of those who responded, one person decided to, to say other, that there was something else they thought was a key milestone. And for them, it was flying on another planet. 
uh, they were really happy to talk about ingenuity and this this test drone flight. Of course, we have the upcoming Dragonfly mission that's going to be a massive drone flying around the surface of Titan. Um, through your career, you've now seen, you know, we've gone from early flybys to having orbiters and then landers and then rovers, now drones flying on other worlds. And so you've kind of seen some of these changes in time, not just like the kinds of the kinds of spacecraft, the vehicles that we send to explore other worlds. Uh, you also were, were around when we first used, for instance, like airbags um, for, for popping down our rovers on Mars. I wonder if you can share with us maybe maybe uh, more you know specifically what that was like, knowing that we were going to bounce a rover on the surface of Mars and hope that it still worked, um, as well as kind of this, this larger structure of developing these different craft for exploration. So let, let me talk about the MER rovers for spirits, spirit opportunity. Um, it, as you might imagine, the science community is extremely excited about the opportunity to send rovers to Mars with with their choice of instrumentation. And um, so this is fantastic. Everybody, you know, oh my God, we're going to get to go. We're going to send these little geological explorers going around the surface. It will be fantastic. And so I remember with the science team, the first time we saw the the video of the entry, descent, and landing process in which they were using airbags. And to a T, the science community almost had a heart attack when they see this thing rocket down and then bounce on the surface, something like 30 meters into the air and, you know, bounce again and bounce again and then kind of roll around. It's like, you're going to do this with my precious instruments? Are you kidding me? It, it, was, it was heart-stopping to see that to think of the delicate things you've been working on and trying to make them work robust so that they work, to have to survive that landing. It, it really, <laughs> it, it was crazy. I, I mean, <laughs> it, it was, uh, it, but it worked. And so that's, in some ways, that's the fun of the whole thing. You know, if, if there was something like MER Rover, EDL, videos or even curiosity videos at the time I was a, a nascent engineer, I probably would have stayed an engineer because that was hair brain and fun. Hmm. So, so the yeah. progression, the more, more, uh, the progression in instrumentation has been really good in terms of what we're getting in terms of data. I must admit, you know, one of the things that with instrumentation on perseverance, we're now getting some spatial resolution of mineralogy and elemental composition. So that gives you a much better hint of what type of mineral and what process has gone through, you know, that when you're looking at it. And it's, it's pretty, pretty amazing. And that's all been enabled. One of the things uh, that I thought was really interesting is when Mars exploration first started, we had something like 11 missions per year, not we, but the world had left like 11 missions per year, mostly because they failed. Yeah. Um, you sent it, it blew up. Okay, let's send another one. And now um, we're, we're down to maybe a couple or maybe one, depending upon um, what year it is and what other countries are all, also sending spacecraft. And, and at first it goes, oh, Mars exploration is declining. No, that actually is not the case. What's happening is we're getting much better at the instrumentation we could put on the spacecraft, and we've certainly increased the odds of having a successful mission. And so we're getting much more information than we ever did early on in, in the phase of exploration. Yeah, absolutely. And we, ha we have a lot more missions in the works right now. There's a lot of missions from from NASA, but also from other space agencies, from JAXA and ISRO and others right now in development for future exploration of Mars and the rest of our solar system and beyond. Um, I encourage our audience, we have a poll right now going on in the YouTube chat uh, to respond to that poll of what kind of mission you'd like to see in the future for Mars, for instance. Um, also, if you have any questions for Dr. Meyer, please drop those in the chat as well, and we'll add those to our queue for after we finish our, our first part of our interview here today. Yeah, um, before we get to that, go don't ahead. forget the uh, Emirates uh, Mars mission. Absolutely, yeah. 
Yeah, the, the Hope mission has been a fantastic mission. You're taking incredible pictures. Um, I think it's also worth pointing out, like Israel was the first nation to be successful um, sending their first mission to Mars. You know, like NASA and early on into the Soviet Union and then Roscosmos. We've had a lot of a lot of missions not make it and a lot of issues over time. And so we are at a point where we have great engineers, great scientists around the world sharing their expertise with each other so that we can have more successful missions from nations that are developing their own space agencies. It's very cool to see. Um, and this might even kind of tie into that then my next question. Uh, right now, the NASA Astrobiology Program is convening a workshop that I'm part of, many of us in the astrobiology community are part of, on communicating discoveries in the search for life in the universe. How do we share these discoveries that we have in various ways from the Allen Hills meteorite um, up through more recent stuff of like exploring the possibility of phosphine on Venus? How will we communicate the potential first finding of biosignatures on an exoplanet or the first possible sightings of some sign of life on Mars? And yeah. so it's really important that we, we do a good job of communicating not just the science, but also like the interpretations and, and how we're getting there. And I wonder kind of, you know, if you have a vision of maybe where things are working in communicating about these discoveries and where we could use some work yet in how we share about Mars exploration, astrobiology uh, with everyone around the world. Uh, that's a really good question. It, it, you know, it's, it's one of those things where I've um, kind of delved into it and then kind of went on to doing other things. They'll back into it to see if there's anything changed in five years type of setting. Um, part of, I'll, I'll say one thing. Well, no, the, so one of the things I'm, I'm proud of for NASA is they're, they have worked into the ethic of the public needs to know what we're doing, right? So there's the, I got a discovery, you tell it. You might wait a day to make sure that your discovery is real so you don't like you know, jerk around the, the, the population in terms of what you thought was a discovery. But the point is, it's not, don't keep it a secret. It's not, a, it's not something we should be doing. We should be proud of the work we're doing, proud of the attempts of work that we're doing. Failures are also news and we shouldn't hide from them because it's a learning process. So I very much feel that the only way to do this is to make sure that we have, that we're upfront with what we're doing and we report out as soon as we have a reasonable idea that it's real, um, our findings. And that includes the prospect of finding life. And, and there, I think right now, NASA really enjoys a reputation for being upfront with what they're doing, much more so than any other uh, agency in the US. And I think that's I think that's really critical and it's a, an important currency to take care of. Because as an example, when we bring samples back, it's going to require a reasonable amount of trust from the from the public that we're going to do the right thing and we're going to tell them what we find. This is, this is not a secret and we're not going to hide things under the table. So one is open communication and making sure that, you know, what we tell people is what we think we know. And I think that how you do it could be, you know, that's going to change with time in terms of what, what is, how important social media, do you have the president make the announcement, all these. And certainly you, you have a process where you want to make sure that those who need to make immediate decisions need to be aware before kaboom, the news gets out. And we kind of went through that process with ALH 84001 of making sure that the president knew before we had a press conference. Mm -hmm. So other than that, um, I'll, I'll touch on a little bit. Is, um, we did look into how do you communicate? And so there, I'll, I'll pick an example. Um, when we talk about looking for life in other places and, and the potential that life could have started somewhere else, like on Mars or, or on Europa, we don't call it the second genesis. And, and not that it's potentially inaccurate. Um, it's more of genesis is a religious 
concept that's applicable to a good portion of the population in the world, but not everybody. And, and what we should be doing is looking for whether or not life started somewhere else, not overlaying it with some, with a religious viewpoint. Um, and so, so let's say making sure that we kind of go through those things and relay the facts without our uh, our emotional biases in terms of how that affects our other beliefs, I think is an important thing to do. Mm, absolutely. It's important for us to understand the, the range of human belief and understanding to communicate together about our interest in exploration, life detection, and those kinds of things. Um, I do want to jump to our audience poll real quick before we move to our next segment. Um, our audience poll, uh, Dr. Meyer, we asked our audience who are watching right now, that you know, if they weren't if they weren't limited by funding, what do they want to see happen in future Mars exploration? And so we had a few answers. AC said that they want a mission that includes liquid chromatography, mass spectroscopy. Um, since the the pyrolysis stuff just burns me up, they say. <laughs> um, rendering reality three D animations wants more drones to cover further distances around the surface of Mars. Esme Kuiper wants liquid analysis of Martian soils um, to look for biomarkers. Jan Spacek. Uh, once the ALF uh, uh, instrument by Alpha Mars, which is a group who has proposed a specific uh, life-finding uh, detector of their own, um, for you, uh, what do you think? If you were li not limited by money, what do you think we should send to Mars next? I don't know. That's a that's a. Um, so I, th this may sound boring, but I think it would be tremendously exciting. Is multiple sample returns. Um, and, and the reason is, is that when, you, when you're doing remote science, you see Mars globally. So you can ask sort of, um, let, for sake of analogy, single point questions globally. You know, for instance, is there a water bearing mineral on Mars? Go around. Yeah, you can answer that question, but you're limited in what you can learn because of you're looking at everything globally. When you pick a region, you go there, you're at a region that has a specific geologic history. And when you take a sample, you're taking a sample of a, of a region that has a specific uh, geologic history. And part of our the science process of picking samples is, if this is the geologic history, this is what we think, and this is, here's a sample that has the greatest likelihood of having evidence of life. That's one, you know, that's one region that you just sampled. And, and then the problem is you may not actually have fully understood what that region was like and what was going on. Number two, the Martians didn't read the book about where they should be living. And so that sample may not be the best sample representing the region that maybe did have the potential life, but that's not the right sample. So being able to do that in multiple places, I think is a really a great way to nail down not only the geologic history of Mars and the history of the interior, but also the potential for life. Mm, I love it. It reminds me of uh, in science fiction, like Star Trek and Star Wars and Stargate and all these shows, they go to an alien planet and they, they assume that all of the life, all of the culture, all of the things they find in the one place they go to is the way the entire rest of the planet is, um, which is not how Earth functions. And so it's kind of silly to think that would happen elsewhere. Um, I do want to jump to our next segment, um, but just real quick. Um, you know, you, you shared that you have been a scuba diver and involved in treasure hunting. Um, we can also say that, you know, you were involved in, you, you like cycling. Um, but I'm also curious. So you're also an apiarist. Uh, you keep bees. Um, what got you interested in beekeeping and made that, you know, part of your life? Uh, basically, when I was a graduate student, a friend of mine got a job and he goes, hey, you want a beehive? I said, I don't know anything about bees. He goes, you don't need to know anything here. <laughs> and he gave me a beehive. So I had bees when I was a graduate student, and I thought it was really interesting. And I didn't know any. It, they took care of the bills. The bees didn't read any books, and they knew what to do. So it was really easy. And then, <laughs> <I love> <laughs> um, basically, I guess twenty years, a little bit more than twenty years ago, new parasites came to the United States and started uh, really taking down the uh, bee population, and. 
you know, me being a biologist said, well, you know, one of the ways to help is to create genetic diversity. And the bee industry itself doesn't help because they take all the bees, ship them off to California to, to pollinate almonds and then bring them all back. So there's a real mixing of, of the national gene pool for bees. So I thought, okay, I'll just have a couple of bees on, uh, on my porch stuff. And so I started getting back into it. And essentially, I found it much harder than it was when I was a graduate student because of, because of the challenges, uh, the, the, par the pests that have been brought into the U.S. And so that challenge has intrigued me. And now that I'm retired, I'll have the opportunity to actually do a good job and pay attention to bees and learn what I can and see if I can really um, – start doing some experiments and, and and improve bee survival rates. Right now, the bee survival rates are about 50% in the, across yeah. the country. And yeah, it's rather staggering. a huge variation between backyard beekeepers and community inter, uh, commercial enterprises. So I find yeah. it as a really interesting challenge. And it's something that I could do on whatever level is I'm comfortable with. So. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, so I'm going to jump to our next segment now. This is our faster than light segment intended for short 30 second responses. Okay. Um, just for a little fun for our audience. We love to ask this of all of our guests. My first question is what is your favorite answer to Fermi's question? Where are they? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. One, Fermi did the right thing. They're all, you know, the, the numbers wise, they should, they're out there. So what, what's the story? And so there, I have two answers. One is Space is really vast, and covering that distance, it takes a real miracle in terms of physics. And we, we hypothesize our ways to shorten the, you know, shorten the time it takes to cover those spaces. But the other is, aliens might not care. You know, it's kind of like, ah, so what? You know, they're off, they found better worlds to explore kind of thing. And, hmm. and the third one, which is, you know, favorite sci-fi is, uh, yeah, maybe they're They've already come and seen us multiple times, and we just don't know. Yeah, a lot of possibility. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, so why do we care? My next question is, what stories have inspired you to want to know more about the nature of life in the universe? Oh, um, that's, that's kind of an interesting one in that I, I don't read a lot of sci science fiction, but I do like it. And so, like, the story, the foundation, uh, the trilogy – really got me interested in terms of thinking about long-term vision, thinking about uh, the evolution of technology, things about how to get out there. Um, I would, I'm going to go back to Jacques Cousteau in terms of part, part of my interest in whether or not there's life out there is sort of a, where is there life here on this planet? And the fact that we don't know where it is in all the places and there might even be a crypto life, something that started early on is not successful in our more benign environment. Really fascinates me in that, in that we don't have a good idea of how life got started. We don't know really what its true limits are. So that kind of overall question is driven. Sorry, I'm going longer than 30 yeah. seconds. No worries. <laughs> Um, so, you know, you've had an illustrious career. You've been involved in so many missions and, and programs with NASA. If you could go back to the beginning of your career and give yourself some advice, what would you say? So, um, what I don't advertise very much is that I flunked out my first year in college. And the reason is that I got to college, I was doing okay. I really enjoyed college for all the wrong reasons, um, but I didn't really have an idea of why I was there. And, and also it was one of those things I felt like I had to be good at everything. And it was daunting that some subjects were harder than others. And, and, you know, even if I tried hard, I may not get an A kind of thing. Um, so the advice would be, you know, figure out, you know, why do you want to make sure you know why you want to do it? And then the second is, is that you, you can't be good at everything. Do, do your best, right? Make your efforts because what you're learning, who knows when it's going to be useful, whether or not you think it is useful today. So, and, yeah. and luckily I, I 
didn't like not going to college and went back and became a better student and uh, figured out why I was interested in going to college and, and found the science to be a good driver for how I want to live the rest of my life. That's wonderful. Yeah, and we, we all meander in these different paths in our lives and the, the professions that we take. Now, of course, right now in astrobiology, a lot of people are interested in exploring our solar system and elsewhere. But the question for you in this segment, if there is alien life out there, do you think we're more likely to find it first in our own solar system or first from an exoplanet? Um, so, I, so, okay, here's the problem. And the problem is um, numbers versus information. I, we have an amazing number. We have over, what, 5,600 planets discovered already. But we have no idea of how to look at those planets and tell us whether or not there's life there. I, I mean, I, I'm, I shouldn't be quite so dismissive. But, you know, it, it's, a, it's a real problem. You know, we measure two different gases. Does that mean there's life? Well, according to my theory, it does. According to somebody else's theory, it doesn't. Here in our solar system much fewer numbers of things that we think have the potential for life, but we have a much greater opportunity of determining whether or not what we find really is evidence of life. So I'm not answering your question. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, I will say, so we do have a bunch of questions coming in from our audience and I apologize to the audience watching. I will try my hardest to get to them as soon as I possibly can. We'll start that here in just a moment. But my next question, Dr. Meyer, is also my most favorite of our Faster Than Light segment. What is an unbelievable science fact that still blows your mind? Um, the, the closest extrasolar planet is a little over four light years away. So there's two aspects of that. One is the clo our closest neighbor has a planet, right? There's planets all over the place. This, that blows my mind. And then if you do the numbers, so, and the numbers of, you know, look, just for the sake of argument, 100 billion stars in a galaxy, 100 billion galaxies in the universe, half of them have planets. This is an unbelievable number of potential for life. But the other is our nearest neighbors is four light years away. It, it, it boggles the mind how far that is. And yeah. so any chance of us going from the remote sensing stage to actually getting there, we're going to need a, a mission that we're willing to wait centuries for the, for the data to get back. Um, yeah. It's all staggering when you think about it. Um, I am going to jump to our audience Q&A now. We have a bunch of questions, so I'll do my best to get to as many as I can here in the time that we have left. First off is from user AC. They're curious uh, why we wouldn't collect uh, uh, frozen water or frozen CO2 from Mars for a sample return. And I imagine we would want to. Um, can you speak to that, the importance of maybe bringing back frozen water or CO2 from Mars? So the, there, there's a, a practical answer in that how do you keep it frozen during the whole process? And, and as an example right now, we've had to put engine, you know, we've had to put temperature constraints on the samples and their transit back to Earth. And what it looks like for almost all of it, we'll keep it under 30 degrees centigrade. And this is a, this is a challenge in and of itself. So keeping it at a frozen temperature, certainly frozen CO2, it, it would be Extremely difficult. You'd have to have a refrigeration process during the whole on whole way on sap return. So it's right now at least it's almost impractical. The second answer is what information would we actually really get from a frozen ice sample or frozen CO2 sample, frozen, you know, dry ice sample that is more information rich than bringing back a core. So that's that's the other driver. Mm, very intriguing. Uh, Lindsay Hayes uh, of the NASA Astrobiology Program and a previous guest of our show uh, wants to know, what is something during your career that you thought we would learn or do or discover that we didn't? Um, so 
What did well? I, I put it more in terms of what didn't work, and that was a, I was on BS two, which is a probe that that was supposed to be released from orbit, and then plummet to Mars and make some measurements after it landed, and it did not work on on uh, Mars Polar Lander for lots of reasons, and we haven't tried it since, and I think it's too bad because it's a great way to to cheaply in quotation marks, get instruments across the planet. And so because of that, we, we've never learned how to do that process. So that's one of those things that it didn't, it didn't work. And because of that, people are hesitant to try it again, which is too bad. Hmm, indeed. Um, user rendering reality 3D animations wants to know um, your viewpoint on getting government appropriators motivated to fund long-term exploration projects something like Mars sample return or technology demonstrations like Ingenuity, um, what does it take to motivate our legislators to be interested in our long-term projects in space exploration? I know that's probably a very big question. I was going to say, if anybody has an answer to that, please let me know because we know <laughs> we could use it. It's, you know, you have to sell the vision, right? And then, and then stay the course. Uh, that's that's uh, two of those, those two things are hard. Uh, we for uh, sample return is a great example of we've gone through a uh, two century on uh, two decades of trying to okay we should do sample return and you know we finally got it incorporated as part of what NASA is going to be doing but now it's maintaining that course in times of when funding gets tight or things don't go as you actually planned out which is typical so it's that's hard. And I think part of it is, oh, I can say this. You know, the community can go and talk to their Congress people and tell them what's important and why it's important, understanding that they may have a different perspective. Cool science has its uh, own appeal, but also jobs in their district, et cetera, they, they listen to that. So part of it is that the science community thinks it's interesting and ought to be funded. Their uh, representatives should hear about it, and it increases the odds that they'll vote the right way when the opportunity comes. Mm, fantastic. Um, so on kind of a similar vein to some degree, uh, our ambassador of the month, Dr. Jim Pass, asked on X uh, that as an astrosociologist, he, he considers the social sciences, humanities, and these things and their relationships – uh, to space exploration. So he wants to know of you, how might sociologists and those doing more humanities focused work bring in their research into what we're doing right now in space exploration and astrobiology? So I'll, I'll say a couple of things. One of the things we did early on in astrobiology is with the, I and mean, I mentioned part of this is with the um, uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science, we started a series of dialogues the dialogues on science, ethics, and religion. And basically, things that we're touching on with astrobiology and sort of what's the origin of life, uh, what's the nature, nature of artificial life, things how society thinks about it. And we brought in people uh, from different religions to help with that discussion. Uh, it, it's an inter it was an interesting series of workshops. That's one of the things that we, we did that early on, and they're still doing some of that looking in terms of, you know, what astrobiology is doing and what people might think of it and what people might think of it might affect how, what astrobiology is doing. So that's one of them. In terms of um, social sciences, I think of in terms of social interactions and a lot of that is, let's say not directly in the purview of astrobiology, but certainly uh, our future as we look into human ex explorers, it will play a huge role in terms of how people interact with each other and the perception of things that are important for as people explore. You know, part of it, a good example is Mars. Should it be a park? You know, should it be a, uh, you know, a no trespass zone except for very good scientific reasons? Or or is it a place where we would want humans exploring or tourists going? And, and I think that's a real ethical question that should be discussed before we actually get to the point where we've already missed a chance to make a decision. Hmm. 
That's very powerful. And I think we're going to end there. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Meyer, for joining us for this episode of Ask an Astrobiologist. It's been a huge pleasure having you. Well, I appreciate it very much, Graham. Thanks. Awesome. And thank you to everyone tuning in and watching. I know we had a lot more questions from our audience that I couldn't get to. I apologize for that. Please reach out online and ask your questions and, and let's continue the conversation elsewhere. Um, if you'd like to be our ambassador of the month next month, just share about the show. Engage with us and share what we're doing. We'd love to hear from all of you. Um, if you'd like to, to learn more about the Mars Exploration Program, for instance, from NASA, you can check out mars.nasa.gov. And of course, uh, if you are not already getting the emails from NASA Astrobiology, please sign up for the NASA Astrobiology email list. It's a way to learn about our show, but also to hear about all of the awesome opportunities and events and all of the things that NASA Astrobiology has going on. Uh, it's a fantastic resource, as is the NASA Astrobiology website. And so thank you, Dr. Meyer, for joining us. Thank you to our audience for watching. Thanks to all watching online on YouTube in the future from now. Uh, so thank you. And remember, stay curious. Stay curious.